Hello. Um, I'm going to talk about a subject that I usually avoid because there's a lot of uh, different opinions and people seem to get in heated quarrels or arguments over this particular subject because everybody thinks they know more than the other person knows and mostly I think it stems from nobody really being comfortable uh, with the subject because we weren't raised to observe uh, the seven appointed times. So <clears throat> with that said I'm going to uh, go ahead and break ranks and uh, make a short video, actually it's probably going to be a long video, <laughs> about the seven appointed times or the seven festivals of Yahuwah. Um, but before we start, I just would like to say that I'm not real familiar uh, with the seven appointed times because I wasn't raised up in them. Okay, so what I do know and what I have learned and what I feel comfortable within my own skin doing and how to observe them, I will share with you. Um, but as time goes on and I become more familiar and obtain more knowledge about the seven point at times, uh, some of my opinions may change. And so probably some of your opinions as well will change. Uh, the main thing is to stay flexible, and uh, when you learn more truth, get rid of the mistake or the error that you were doing or practicing, and uh, adopt the truth. You know, so the goal is to weed out all lies, falsehood, deceit, delusions, idolatry out of our life, and to be clean, perfect, with no blemish or spot, no wrinkle. That's the goal. To be stubborn, hard-headed, stiff-necked, arrogant, um, acting like you know it all, puffed up uh, over any subject really is ridiculous. Uh, it's, it's not of the spirit of Yahusha, that's for sure. So, this, uh, I'm willing to do it because I've had several people that have asked me to do this. And um, like I said, usually I've been avoiding it intentionally because, uh, like I said, a lot of different opinions, a lot of different approaches to how to celebrate or observe or keep the seven appointed times. Uh, the the uh, probably the most um, disputed, if you will, festival of them all is is Pesach. The sock engulfs the uh, springtime or the summer uh, festivals, and, and what I mean by that is when they say Pesach, they can they can reference be referenced in Passover or all of the spring festivals put together, which is uh, the Last Supper, Passover, you know, seven days of unleavened bread, the Kurum or first fruits and Shabuath or Pentecost. Uh, a lot of some people don't uh, put Pentecost or Shabuath in with the Pasach, you know, um, and so they keep that separated. So like I said, there's a lot of different angles here. All right, so anyway, uh, the, uh, the uh, time of period we're in right now in the fall, uh, we we're in right now in the fall festivals, and there's three in the fall. So four summer, four and three winter. Four summer, three winter. Okay, uh, is how scripture uh, describes them. Um, so the three fall or three winter festivals uh, is Yom Teruah, which we've just went through, and now we're actually in the days of all, which encompasses ten days, and then we. At the end of the days of all, or the 10-day span, comes Yom Kippur, or Yom Kafar, 
Day of Atonement, and then five days later is the fest festival or Feast of Booths, or a Feast of Tabernacles. Okay, and so these fall festivals uh, are not that hard uh, until you get to the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles or Tents. Uh, and then it is probably the hardest one to do because you have to actually work. You have to build yourself a booth or set up a tent. Um, I know, personally know some people that love the outdoors and they love to go camping. So if you're a, an outdoor enthusiast and you love to camp, then the Festival of Booths will probably be your, become your favorite festival or point in time because um, they go out for a whole week. They take vacations. Some of them take vacations. And they go out somewhere and they set up a tent and a campground and they fish and worship and praise Yahuwah for seven days. And they tear down their tent after the seventh day and then the eighth day is the, you know, the last great day or the closing day of the festival. You don't stay in your tent or your temporary dwelling on the eighth day. All right, so, like I said, Pesach is probably the most disputed and quarreled and confusing one because it's engulfed so much, so much going on, uh, and, and, and involves a lot of tradition. That's the main thing is to weed out all the tradition, and then it clears up a little bit more. So that's the one that people seem to argue about when it is, what it is, what do you do, what don't you do what you eat, what you don't eat, and blah, blah, blah. You know, that's, the, that's the big quarrelsome uh, disputed seven festival, the, the four in the spring of the seven. Uh, or three, if you want to include the Sabbath by itself or Pentecost by itself. I don't see where it really matters. But uh, the last three are probably the, uh, the hardest one, the hardest ones to do. Uh, because it, it involves a lot of repenting, a lot of praying, fasting, and camping out. Okay, like I said, though, if you're an outdoor enthusiast, probably your favorite festival will be the Festival of Tents or Booths. Uh, so anyway, without any further ado, let's get started on our study about the seven festivals. And I'll do the best I can here. Y'all bear with me. Uh, the seven festivals are the redemption plan for the body of Yahusha. He is revealing his redemption plan to his elect through the festivals. That's the purpose of them. This lesson, like I said, it will be mostly for the people whom, like me, have not spent a lifetime celebrating the seven spiritual, spiritually based festivals, but may be beneficial even for those who have been in the way for a long time and have been celebrating the festivals for quite a long time. Usually the festivals are somewhat of a mystery for most of us. In the true meanings remain somewhat fuzzy especially about what they represent spiritually, what they mean and how to observe them. There are seven appointed times, also known as seven festivals or feasts. These festivals are uh, indivisibly uh, connected as a purposed series of festivals, and each one represents a specific role in the redemption plan of Yahuwah. All seven are vitally important, and each one is ordained by Yahuwah or Elohim. To begin to celebrate these festivals will not be easy. It is something that we must approach slowly, carefully, and thoughtfully. We should not treat them as the next new thing or fad. We must take them seriously. They are mandatory, permanent, and we must observe them as absolute set-apart rehearsals or modems. 
On the contrary, we have been commanded by Yahuwah to observe them with rejoicing and celebration, not with fear and dread. Oh, here comes that festival again. We've got to set up that tent. Although most of us were not taught them as a child, we must learn these high Sabbath commands if we want to obey the voice of our Maker. The key to celebrating them properly is manifesting Yahuwah's intended purpose for each of his appointed festivals according to his word. The festivals or appointed times are a shadow of things to come for the body of Yahusha, and they are performed as any professional rehearsal would be. We are the actors in a row, and we should be practicing as if the real event is taking place, which it will. <clears throat> this role playing will prepare us for the reality that is soon to come. Hopefully, by becoming familiar with these events, we will not faint or be burned up like the wrongdoers. We will be prepared. Most, of, most will be unprepared and shocked when the sun goes black and the moon turns to blood. They will stand in awe at the darkness while the reapers overtake them. Scripture says, And you shall trample the wrongdoers, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, said Yahuwah Zaboeth. You can read more about that day in Isaiah 24, Joel 2, Malachi 3 and 4, Luke 21, Matthew 24, and Revelations chapter 6 through 20. By annually observing the festivals, we will know that our redemption comes at the sound of the trumpet just days prior to the great and awesome day of Yahuwah. Read Isaiah 25. It would be appropriate that uh, we begin on this journey by diligently researching out the seven appointed times in Scripture themselves. As a sort of a disclaimer, if you will, a self-study is highly recommended and would be the best course of action for you to take. In other words, don't take my word for it. Do your own research. However, if you're willing, we will begin this short study together. But first, please allow me to point out that while we might question the multitude of rabbinic, uh, rabbinic uh, laws, traditions and customs that have evolved surrounding each festival, we cannot question the legitimacy of the festivals themselves because they are all found and called out by name in the scriptures and not just in the Old Testament either, although that should be plenty of reason enough for us to consider them. We will also find them mentioned and being observed in the New Testament many times as well. In fact, every time we find Yahusha either in or on his way to Jerusalem, it was for the purpose of his participation in these appointed times. Henceforth, the observance of every one of these seven appointed times was validated by our Messiah in the Nazarene writings or the New Testament. Many others also guarded them, at, such as Joseph and Mary, the Twelve Apostles, the 120 Nazarene in the upper chamber that were there during Sabuath. Paul, who was always in a frenzy to get back to Jerusalem in time to keep them, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the priests, the Sanducees, Sadducees, the public leaders, and of course all the inhabitants of Israel can be found keeping the festivals in the New Testament. This is also seen recorded years at even decades after the ascension of the Messiah. It shall be a statue to you forever, says it says in Leviticus 16. Forever means forever, folks, and the command to celebrate them is not optional. On the other hand, we should be attentive and do our best to separate the mixture of men's traditions 
and Yahuwah statues. I personally elect to shun the traditions as much as possible, or remove them as much as possible, especially if they undermine the blood atonement works of Yahusha for the remission of sins. Nevertheless, use caution in your elimination process because it is perpetual that we observe all the scriptural based statues of Yahuwah. Unfortunately, this will not be easy. Both Christianity and Orthodox Judaism has tremendous amounts of customs, traditions, men's teachings, ceremonial events, propaganda, and paganism mixed into their worship of Yahuwah. In these latter days, Yahuwah is doing something new. From the two, he is making one. He is mingling the partial truth of Judaism and the partial truth in Christianity and making one true worshiper, thus making peace. To his esteem, in order to receive praise and worship in truth and spirit. Read Ephesians 2. On the contrary, he is removing the falsehood and lies from the mouth of his called out ones. It would be wise to worship Yahuwah exactly the way he commands us to. A brief note to our Orthodox Jewish brethren and whomever it may concern, since the Holy Temple is no longer standing and no sacrifices for sin can or should be offered, those who know Yahusha can trust in the permanent blood sacrifice that he made for our atonement, believe in his resurrection from the dead, and continue in the great expectation of his redemption work. Mashiach Yahusha is now the high priest from the line of Melchizedek. Uh, read Genesis 14, Psalms 110, Hebrews chapters 5, 6, and 7, and Hebrews chapters 13 through 17. Sins overwhelmed me, but you atone for our transgressions. The notion that a human blood sacrifice was made against Torah is not truth. We read in Acts 20, 28, the assembly of Elohim was purchased with his own blood. If possible, read Isaiah 53. This chapter does not speak of Israel, but perfectly speaks of Yahushua HaMashiach. If that is not possible for you because of your belief, then please read Zechariah chapter 10 through 14. Shalom. Now let's continue on with our study of the ordained seven festivals or appointed times. Each of these seven festivals is given a specific name with specific days and months for the observances to occur. Yet in reality, very little information is given as to exactly how each of the festivals is to be observed. Over the centuries, the Yehudim, or Jews, have come up with many traditions and customs to fill that void. Again, the seven appointed times themselves are not man-made traditions, but are written down ordained commands found in scriptures, or the Tanakh. And not merely as simple things mentioned in scripture either but as commanded festivals that Yahuwah says are perpetual. It is fallacy and just plain error on the part of Christians in general when they demand that scripture begins with the book of Matthew and that everything before it, such as Shabbat, keeping, festivals, the Ten Commandments, and more is dead, gone, old, obsolete, irrelevant, or was written for the Jews only. That's ridiculous. This simply is not truth. In fact, this type of thinking only promotes lawlessness, which is sin. Read 1 John 3. True worship is obedience to all of Yahuwah's instructions or Torah. Apparently, some modern day scholars even teach that since the Messiah had come and fulfilled prophecy and performed the Torah perfectly, 
that we can just wad up those great works that they call the Old Testament and throw them in the rubbish bin of antiquity or history. But now, let's read what Rabbi Yahusha taught on this subject in Matthew 5. He said, Do not think that I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to complete. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, one jod or one tittle shall by no means pass from the Torah until all is done. Whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches men so shall be called least in the reign of the Shemayim. But whoever does and, and teaches them, he shall be called great in the reign of the Shemayim. This is coming directly from the mouth of the one who both created the Torah and redeemed us under its blood covenant. Whom do you think is teaching the truth, folks? The Messiah? or the modern day scholars. The seven appointed times completely model the mission, the sequence, and the significance of Yahushua's redemptive work. In other words, these seven appointed times, in addition to being literal commands of Yahuwah found in the Torah, which are fully intended to be practiced year after year, also outline prophetic patterns that will be fulfilled by Yahushua HaMashiach, our Deliverer. Was the Messiah upset with the scholars of his day for teaching and keeping the Torah in the appointed times? Or was he upset with them for breaking it and holding fast to the traditions of men? I'll give you a hint. Read Mark 7. The festivals are time to be in tune with the agricultural seasons. When scripture speaks of seasons, remember that for the Hebrews, a season was all about when to plant and when to harvest. Clearly, the festivals are organ, uh, organic, organically connected as to when we should observe them, organically connected as to when we should observe them. There are four summer festivals and three winter festivals, equating the sum seven. Please note, most people recognize the festivals as being counted as three springtime, one summer, and three fall. Although we are all familiar with four seasons, the scripture only mentions two seasons, summer and winter. With point taken, in order to eliminate confusion, we will use the four seasons that we are familiar with for the remainder of our conversation. Basically, then, each festival is significant and prophetic as follows. The Passover speaks of remission. The Messiah, our Passover lamb was slain for us, and his blood atones for our sins. Seven days of unleavened bread speaks of sanctification or set-apartness. The ordinance against the use of leavening is scripturally symbolic of absence of sin, absence of men's traditions, the absence of being puffed up or arrogant or conceited, the absence of decay and corruption. Scripture says, Therefore cleanse out the old leaven, so that you are a new lump, as you are unleavened. For also Messiah, our Passover, was offered for us. So then let us observe the festival, not with old leaven, not with the leaven of evil and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of serenity or sincerity, and truth. Bikurim, uh, <clears throat> or first fruits, is the wave sheaf offering. Speaks of firstlings, the first of things which always belongs to Yahuwah al Shaddai. Yahusha was the firstborn of all creation. In reference to Messiah, first fruits are about his resurrection from the dead. Being the first resurrection from the dead. He was called the first fruits. Yahushua had a dual nature, two distinct natures in a way that no other human being has ever had. 
One nature is human or fleshly, the other nature is divine or spirit. As such, he was both fully man and fully Elohim. Some attributes of Yahushua proving his deity are he was without sin. He transubstantiated water into wine. He walked on water. He healed diseases. He healed the blind and the deaf. The lame rose and walked. He brought the dead back to life. He could read without learning. He was able to transform, translate, elevate, shapeshift. He defied gravity. He walked through walls. And ultimately, the Son, or the Incarnation, died. But Yahuwah did not die. And he resurrected the Incarnation back to life after three days and three nights in a tomb, being cloaked in immortality. And then he ascended back into the heavens from whence he came back into the fullness and greatness and completion or of Elohim. Yahushua was the first human to be resurrected and receive an incorruptible body. In the future, two other resurrections will take place involving the righteous and the unrighteous. Next we have the summer festival, if you will, called Shabuoth, also known as the Festival of Weeks and Pentecost. Why Bikuram represented the first fruits of the first grain harvest of the year, which was barley. Fifty days later, Shabuoth represents the celebration of the second grain harvest of the year, which was wheat. Although not plainly spe specified in scripture, Shabuoth has long been commemorated as the giving or the accepting of the blood covenant at Sinai and celebrated as our marriage anniversary between Yahuwah and his people Israel. Shabuot was timed to occur exactly 50 days from first fruits. See the pattern yet? Yahushua died on Passover day, which in the tomb and was in the tomb before the first day of Matzah came. He rose on Bikurim in the wave sheaf offering. Or as the wave sheaf offering. It is written that the Ruach HaKadosh descended on 120 followers in the upper chamber on Shabuoth, immersing them as with fire, and they began to speak in other tongues or foreign tongues. That's an Acts 2. This event fulfilled the promised renewed covenant prophesied in Jeremiah 31. What is most important for us to grasp here at this point, folks, is that the Messiah fulfilled the first four festivals on the exact appointed day of each of the festivals perfectly and precisely. The flawless fulfillment of the first four festivals by Yahushua in order confirms that the pattern for the great works of salvation occurring on the festival days will continue in their proper sequence. Why would we think that the acts and works of the Messiah that are perfectly exemplified in the first four festivals would suddenly stop being so in the final three festivals. The last three festivals occur in a very narrow scope of time, within 15 days of each other. Indeed, scripture does tell us that no one knows that day or the hour of his coming which may imply more accurately to the year of his coming, rather than the day and hour, as it seems highly likely that the return of Yahuwah will be precisely as the redemption plan has foreshadowed it to be. Nevertheless, we can know the season, and the season is definitely in the fall. Let's take a closer look at these three fall festivals now. The first of the fall festivals is Yom Teruah, 
or the day of trumpets. Yom Teruel was first ordained in the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, and more information was given to us in Numbers, chapter 29. <coughs> the second fall festival is Yom Kippur, also known as Yom Kippur, or the day of covering, the day of atonement, and simply the fast. The ten intervening days connecting these two festivals are known as the Days of Awe, which we are in right now. During the Days of Awe, every person is supposed to carefully consider their lives and vermently repent daily. As we pass through these ten Days of Awe, we should take time to get our lives right with Yahuwah and one another. This is the time to forgive release and bless those who have hurt us and to seek forgiveness from those whom we have hurt as well. Only after we have recounseled with our brothers or sisters in the Messiah should we call upon the mercy of our Maker for ourselves. Salah. May His will be done according to His word and His loving kindness in your life. These ten days of all is the best time to seriously seek the face of Yahuwah. Repent means turn back or reverse course. Torah means instructions. During these ten days of all, we should repent daily, read the Torah daily, and obey them stringently. It is a time to sober up and call upon His most excellent mercy for ourselves, our families, our leaders, our nations, and for all Israel, including that which is lost, or those which are lost. This is a great opportunity to become good and faithful servants by taking practical steps to be His instruments of truth, reconciliation, forgiveness, charity, peace, and love. Additionally, considering that Yahushua is our High Priest, the mediator of the covenant and master of the Sabbath, this would be an excellent time to lie down at the feet of Yahushua, begging Him to intercede for us by personally presenting our prayers and petitions to the Father. Yahushua said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Read John 14. At the end of Yom Kippur, shortly before sunset, there is a closing service held called the Ni'ila prayer, which acknowledges the last chance for forgiveness prior to the closing of the gate or door of prayer. The only time the Ni'ela prayer is ever used is during this closing ceremony. Specifically, the final prayers of repentance are recited. Finally, Yom Kippur comes to an end with the recitation of the Shema in Deuteronomy 6.4. Followed by the blowing of the shofar, which signals the, the conclusion of the fast. Tradition suggests that up until the very last moment, we can still repent and pray for Yahuwah's mercies and receive forgiveness. In fact, it is said by tradition that entry through the narrow gate is never easier than in the last minutes just prior to the closing of Yom Kippur. This is the time when the access to Yahuwah's throne is wide open and Yahuwah is most acceptable to mankind than at any other time of the year. However, when sunset comes and the fast of Yom Kippur is finished, the gate or door is closed and judgment is sealed. The closing of the gate ushers in the second coming of Yahusha and the white throne judgment. This is the redemption of the living or those who remain alive that follows the first resurrection of the dead. Yahuwah's desire is that everyone would repent and no one would perish. So repent for the kingdom of Yahuwah 
is near to you. Read 2 Peter 3 and Matthew 18. Interestingly, in the New Testament, or the Renewed Covenant, Yahushua told us that he is the door and the gate for his sheep, and the sheep go in and out of pastures through him. He also said his sheep will know his name, and they will know his voice. Scripture says, Behold, I am the door, or the gate. Whoever enters through me, he will be delivered, and shall go in, and shall go out, and find pasture. There is no doubting that Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur are two major action-packed events. Both rehearsals are based on the futuristical true story and true events that will, are soon to come. They are featuring the second coming of Yahusha and the day of Yahuwah, respectively. A mistaken translation suggests that these two festivals are a day for convocation or gathering together. This is a slight translational error involving the Hebrew word mikra, meaning to proclaim or call to rehearsal. In addition to the weekly seventh-day Sabbath that we should all be familiar with, Elohim appointed these festivals as high Sabbaths that are similar but subtly different than the weekly rest days. These festival high Sabbath days have always been associated with the various seven festivals from their origins. At the time of the old priesthood on Yom Teruah, special sacrifices centering on burnt offerings was to be presented to Yahuwah, and shofars were blown throughout the day. With the destruction of the second temple, in 70 AD, the burnt offerings have stopped, but the ordained command to blow the shofar is still practiced today. Although Yom Teruah is defined as the day of trumpets, it is not a trumpet blast we are commanded to blow, but a shofar made from a ram's horn. Indeed, on certain occasions, a trumpet, specifically a silver trumpet, was to be blown. But in this case, the word teruah suggests a shofar, which not only indicates that the instrument is to be a ram's horn, but indicates a very specific series of blasts on the ram's horn. Virtually all the customs surrounding Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur that are practiced by Orthodox Yehudim or Jews are tradition. Practically none of the members recognize Yahushua as the Messiah. In fact, the reading of Isaiah 53 is strictly prohibited in most, if not all, synagogues. We must seek out Yahushua's perspective as it is written, not men's traditional view being led by the spirit of error, born of pagan origins. Truth is reality. Tradition is religion which is based on falsehoods. Therefore, truth is the arch enemy of tradition because the truth, or light, shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. But the truth, or light, has exposed the darkness or the lies. Interestingly, scripture says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Least you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fulfillment of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel shall be saved. That's in Romans 11. I believe that means till all the lost sheep are found. Another very popular tr tradition among the Jews suggests that Yom Kippur is the day Yahuwah sets in judgment of the universe once a year. This is not considered an eternal judgment or the well-known white throne judgment, but rather it is when he hands out merits for those who have been obedient and discipline on those who have not. It applies to individuals and to nations. Of 
accordingly, he decides on Yom Kippur who will be blessed in the following year and who will be cursed. Yom Kippur, more than any other day, exemplifies Yahuwah's judging attribute. So while there is the command for rejoicing and celebration, there is also soberness of mind and heart. In other words, on Yom Teruah, it is written, and on Yom Kippur, it is sealed. Prophetically, Yom Teruah shadows the last trump or the final warning of the coming harvest of the earth by the reapers in ten short days that follow. It is the day of the first resurrection of the dead and the first day of the days of all. This begins the final countdown to Yahuwah's judgment on a wicked and unrepentant world and is also the beginning of redemption for the elect. The first fruits of sorts, or wheat, who are alive at his return will be changed in the wink of an eye as the reapers remove the tars or weeds by fire after the closing of Yom Kippur. Read Joel 2. Clearly then, Yom Teruah is the feast that signals the return of Yahusha is near and signifies the final warning preceding the coming harvest in the beginning of judgment. Whether it is this year or next year or some year after that, there is no doubt that Yom Teruah is the day that will signal the Messiah will soon come with a mighty shout of a great messenger, which will sound like the blowing of a shafar. This possibly will be heard across the entire earth proclaiming the soon return of the king. It is a day of great expectation. Look up and keep watch toward the east, for your redemption draws nearer. The return of the king is imminent after the closing of the day of Yom Kippur. Five days later on the first day of tabernacles, which is his birthday. Otherwise, it would break the pattern of the festivals that up to now signaled precisely every single event of Yahushua HaMashiach. Again, read Isaiah 25, verses 8 and 9. Yom Kippur comes abruptly ten days later after Yom Teruah and is the last day of the days of all. It is the climax to humanity's final change or final chance for deliverance from the lake of fire, which is the second death. There will be wailing and gnashing of the teeth. At the end of this day begins the day the prophets refer to as the day of Yahuwah, or the day of darkness. Amos chapter 5 says this, Is not the day of, the Yahu of Yahuwah darkness and not light? Is it not very dark with no brightness in it? Sephania chapter 1 warns us, The great day of Yahuwah is near, a day of wrath, a day of darkness, and a day of trumpet. The trumpet here speaks of the end or closing of a gate or door or the festival of Yom Kippur. In Revelation 6, we read a chilling description of, cast, uh, of a catastrophical proportions. It takes place immediately following the Great Tribulation period. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of the heaven fell to the earth, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Yom Kippur is a day of literal and spiritual darkness for most, a day of wonders and joy for those who trust in him. Yom Kippur is famously and correctly known as the end of days or the, day, or the end of the age because there are no more chances after this. Real time event really occurs. This day, which foreshadows the day of Yahuwah, is the day that the living elect will be changed in a wink of an eyelid 
and put on immortality and be caught up in the clouds with the first resurrection group as they meet Yahusha coming down to the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. Perhaps this seemingly implies that the first resurrection of the dead group of believers will be walking around on the earth for 10 days witnessing to people prior to the closing of Yom Kippur during the days of awe. When the living elect will be redeemed. Because scripture clearly says that they will not be caught up by themselves. Speaking of the first resurrection group. They will be caught up together with the ones who remain alive at the time. And that's ten days later. It, is also, it also mentions that the elect will be walking on the ashes of the wicked. After they are destroyed with fire. What this day means to the Hebrew people is probably best summed up by means of a prayer. If you wish, please seriously consider praying this prayer as you are reading or listening to it. Heavenly Father, set apart be thy name for the sin which we have committed before thee by unclean lips and for the sin which we have committed before thee by impure speech, for the sin which we have committed before thee by our evil inclination, and for the sin which we have committed before thee wittingly or unwittingly, for all these, O Yahuwah of forgiveness, forgive us, pardon us, grant us atonement. In the book of life, blessing, peace, and good substance. May we be remembered and inscribed before thee. In the book of remembrance, may we be inscribed before thee as a treasured possession. Blessings upon blessings, truth upon truth, and love upon love toward you, toward us. According to your great mercy, spare us and give us life. And if you are one that is in the renewed covenant, this prayer and all prayers should be followed up with in the name of Master Yahusha, and through him we pray. Amen. So this prayer conveys or confirms to us that Yom Kippur is a very solemn day that foreshadows the great and awesome day, the day of Yahuwah. Those sealed with the name of Yahuwah are the first fruits or the wheat and are listed in the book of remembrance as a treasured possession because they feared Yahuwah and thought upon his name. They are all redeemed together at the closing of Yom Kippur. Read Malachi 3. The tars, weeds, or the wicked will be removed from the wheat and bundled up for the fire by the reapers. These are the ones that are going to disappear. And the ones that remain behind are the wheat. Traditionally, it is the final day for people to bring themselves in proper perspective before Yahuwah to reflect and recognize our complete and utter dependence upon him, not just for our physical lives, but our spiritual standing as well. A very important point is the, com is the command to fast on Yom Kippur. It is the only time in scripture that we are commanded to fast or reflect your being. Read Leviticus 23. All other fasting involving worship is voluntary. Afflict your being, spiritually speaks of no eating or drinking from evening to evening on Yom Kippur. Although we are only commanded to fast the last day during the days of all, it may not be a bad idea to fast and pray throughout some of the other days of the days of all. Especially if you have a stronghold that is holding you captive or a huge need in your life. Controversially, what we see being practiced in most traditional landscapes, especially among the Yehudim, or Jews, is not only keeping the fast, but they add to it with 
laws such as no washing or bathing, no wearing of perfume or lotions, no wearing leather footwear, and abstaining from marital relations is added to their statues. Despite these prohibitions, the observance of this day is characterized by the sense of peace because of our confidence in our relationship with Yahusha and his provision for atonement. I believe it is essential to comprehend that through Yahusha, the Heavenly Father is accessible to receive repentance any day of the year. But during these perpetual festivals, access to him is heightened to a maximum levels. Henceforth, during the ten days of all, we should pray, fast, and humbly petition Yahuwah continuously. Repent, for the reign of Yahuwah comes near to you. It is impossible to repent while continuing to sin. In other words, you can't repent while remaining lawless. You have to start obeying the commandments. So the days of awe offers a great opportunity to start obeying Yahuwah's commands. This should be done immediately. During these ten days of awe, you may also enjoy reading Exodus 12, Leviticus 23, Isaiah 24, Matthew 24, Acts 17, Psalms 91, Joel 2 and 3, Malachi 3, Colossians 2, Hebrews 4, Matthew 15, Matthew 23, Mark 7, and John 7, and read Daniel and Revelations in context to learn more about these absolute prophetic events. The third and last fall festival is Sukkoth, or Booths. It comes only five days after Yom Kippur. It is the seventh and final festival. Sukkoth is also known as the festival of tents, tabernacles, and booths. It is ordained in Levit Leviticus 23, 33 through 44. The festival of tabernacles is known as the grand finale of all the festivals. Most observers will build booths or set up tents to live in as a temporary dwelling. It's called a Mishkan during the seven-day duration of this festival, but not on the eighth day or the closing day. You're not allowed to stay in your tent on the day of closing or the eighth day. While eating their daily meals, they will reflect on the difficulties the Hebrews must have occurred while living in these temporary dwellings in the wilderness. The first day and the eighth day are high Sabbath rest days. What is called a lulav and itrog is customarily used and is a scripturally ordained part of the celebration that has great symbolism. Scripture says, And you shall take for you on the first day the fruit of good trees, branches of palm trees, twigs of leafy trees, and willows of the stream, and shall rejoice before Yahuwah your Elohim for seven days. The eighth day after the festival of booths is called the last great day. Although our booths or tents remind us of the hardships for Israel, the children of Israel, while living in their temporary tents for 40 years in the wilderness, this grand finale of all the feast has much more depth spiritual symbolicism and meaning than just that. It speaks of an eternal relationship with Yahuwah and his promise to tabernacle with his people in the new city upon the new earth forever. Not only does the festival of tabernacles foreshadow the coming new heaven, new earth, and new Jerusalem and his kingdom reign, it also looks forward to the marriage consummation and the wedding feast upon the return of the bridegroom, Yahushua HaMashiach. This, of course, follows the great tribulation and judgment of the unrighteous. Indeed, certain scriptures of 
imply that mankind will be observing will be observing Sukkoth or tabernacles forever. Read Zechariah 14. Spiritually speaking, the temporal dwelling place represents our fleshly tent or our mortality. This is implying that the temporal tent will be removed and a permanent, non-corruptible dwelling tent will take its place, which is our immortal tent or immortality. Read 2 Peter 1, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 15. At this point, it does become apparent then that the unrighteous will never see the bride, which is the new city that will be coming down from heaven from Yahuwah. Additionally, the first day of Sukkot, or tents, is also considered the carnal birthday of Yahusha. Many Nazarene elders and Hebrew scholars believe Yahusha was born on the first day of Sukkot, in the fall, in a booth, or temporary animal shelter, in the seventh month of the year. Accordingly, after birth, after their birth, all males were required to be circumcised on the eighth day, immediately following their birth. Since the sovereign Yahushua was born on the first day of tabernacles in the fall, then he was circumcised on the closing day of the festival, also known as the last great day. The last great day looks forward to a renewed cre uh, creation where righteousness dwells and love rules forever. The eighth day circumcision of Yahusha is symbolic of when all hearts will be circumcised with the love for the Torah. Afterwards, all of creation will have been restored back to its or original purpose in life. What is that purpose? to love and be loved while living in a perfect paradise, in a perfect relationship with our perfect creator, and living a perfect, everlasting, incorruptible life, void of sin. Read 1 Corinthians 2. So, although the seven festivals may not have been perfectly defined or traditionally correct, uh, by me in this presentation, we should now have at least have a pretty good conception of what the seven festivals are. At least we should now plainly be able to see a precise, indivisible plan developing, orchestrated by a seven-step pattern of brilliance authored by Yahuwah. In other words, the shadows of things to come for the body of Mashiach should be taken on a more profound shape or understanding for you at this point. Although the first four festivals have been fulfilled precisely, we still commemorate them at their appointed times every year. And as we wait on the last three realities, which come speedily in the same season of the same year, we must obediently perform the called out and set apart rehearsals with celebration, joy, enthusiasm, and great expectation for the return of the king. Clearly, folks, each one of the seven appointed times is vital to his redemption plan and are indivisible. They must be observed at its or uh, on its ordained appointed time, exactly as commanded in the Torah. Don't forget, he is sharing his mind and secrets with us through these seven festivals. Not only has he chosen to reveal his salvation plan for delivering his people, but also he has revealed his redemption plan for the body of the Mashiach, those who have been delivered or will be delivered. 
So it is very clear. The seven appointed times, or the modim in Hebrew, have not been abolished. Matter of fact, they have been declared a Kodesh Mikra for us. They have only been covered up by the Christian holidays. We have a calling to proclaim them and practice the ordained festivals annually, year after year. In Hebrew, the word Kodesh means set apart. The word Mikra means rehearsal. What does the word rehearsal mean? Rehearsal is defined in the dictionary as the act of practicing in preparation for an event. Yahushua said, if you love me, you shall guard my commands. Read John 14. This means all of them, including the seven appointed times. Indeed, true worship or the highest form of worship is obedience to his commands. All of Yahuwah's commands are mandatory, none are optional. If we have entered the renewed covenant through Messiah Yahusha, we are now walking in the spirit and truth. We are no longer slaves to sin and death being set free from what held us captive. Now having a good conscience toward Master Yahusha, we make every effort to fervently obey Father Yahuwah. If we do sin, it is not us according to the inner man that sins, but the fleshly outward wretched man with his body of death that sins. This battle will last as long as we remain in our present fleshly state. And so we must confess the sin immediately and ask our high priest to intercede for us as we ask Yahuwah to forgive us, cleanse us, restore us, and recounsel us back to himself. Read Romans 7. Salah. Thank you for watching. And remember to stay in love with Yahusha. So long, beloved of Yahuwah. Bonus feature time. Um, there is a kind of a weird tradition in Christianity that uh, they say that uh, Yahusha had died on the stake on Good Friday um, and rose from the dead on the following uh, first day of the week or son's day and um, seems to be a timeline problem there <clears throat> so what we want to do here is uh, let's take a look at the passover timeline and solve this issue because scripture says that he was in the tomb for three days and three nights, not two days and two nights. Okay. So we will try to solve this issue by utilizing or referring to the year that Yahusha died. Okay. So, Abib or Nisan in Babylonian language is the original Hebrew name for the first month of the year. Okay, the new year is in the spring, according to scripture. Uh, not a, uh, the, uh, the Yehudim celebrate New Year on Yom Teruah in the fall, which is incorrect and it's not scripturally based. It actually, that has Babylonian uh, origins. They picked that up in the Babylonian captivity era and brought it back with them. That's why they do that. They ignore scripture and continue to practice Babylonian tradition as far as the new year goes. It's not in the fall. It's not on Yom Teruah. So don't do that. Don't follow that example. Uh, scripture says 
New Year's is in the spring, okay? And it's in a bib or Nissan, all right? So uh, the first three festivals are called Pesach, Passover, seven days of unleavened bread, and first fruits. We won't include Shabuoth and, and Pesach in this study. The Jews believe that the first day of Abib or Nisan is the first day of creation. Okay. So how is it that Mashiach could be uh, staked on the sixth day and buried and then resurrected on the first day and that fulfilled the three days and three nights that prophecy requires in scripture well any child knows that the math doesn't add up so let's go through the procedure carefully by revealing some facts that have been overlooked until now Hopefully, we can bring this matter to some sort of solution. Passover is the first appointed time or festival of the season. And then comes the seven days of unleavened bread, or matzah, otherwise known as matzah. This is the second festival of the group, and it commemorates the day that Israel actually began its march out of Egypt, or Mitzrayim. Passover is a one-day event. Unleavened bread is a seven-day event that begins the day immediately following Passover. Because this event happened suddenly and Israel had to leave in a big hurry, there was no time for the Hebrews to prepare their bread in the normal way by adding yeast and letting it rise and then baking it. <coughs> Instead, the Hebrews had to prepare a kind of bread that did not use yeast. This bread called matzah was not, was not even baked. It was prepared by being placed on an open griddle to cook in a similar way as we cook pancakes. Bread was a staple food for the Hebrews, but matzah is the bread of nomads or wanderers without a homeland. And unknowingly to them, the children of Israel was about to become a nation of nomads for a 40-year period. The last festival of, of the Pesach group is called Bikurim, also known as First Fruits. The wave sheep offering that shadowed the reality, the resurrection of Yahusha. Bikurim occurred the day immediately following the first day of Matzah. So we have the commemorance of each festival on the 14th, of the 15th, and the 16th of Abib, and the year that Yahuwah was staked. The final day of the festival is the 21st of Abib, which is the last day of Matzah. Although Bikurim, or First Fruits, is a one-day festival that occurs during the week of unleavened bread, it is counted as a third festival of Pesach because it follows the first day of Matzah. Another important feature of the festival is that Yahuwah made them all high Sabbaths, giving us added rest days during these appointed times. So then, there are two kinds of rest days. The regular weekly seventh day Sabbath, or rest day, that we are all familiar with, and the festival Sabbaths, or high Sabbaths. The seven high Sabbaths have always been part of the festivals from the beginning. In reference to the three early summer or spring festivals, the first day of the seven-day festival of Matzah is one of those high Sabbaths, as is the final day of the seven days of Matzah. According to the Torah, Passover is on Abib 14, 
The first day of matzah is on Aviv 15, and then there was a law until the last day or the seventh day of unleavened bread. During this law, the day after the weekly Sabbath, during the seven days of matzah, on the first day of the following week, the Kurum or first fruits was to be celebrated. Uh, a point, uh, a, a quick note on that is that not all the Hebrews in the Mashiach's time accepted this as being correct. But this was the way the Sadducees practiced it. The Sadducees controlled the earthly priesthood and everything that went on at the Temple Mount during that era. Tradition insists that first fruits be always on a bib 16. However, this is not always the case, but it is true during certain years. The reason they do that is because they don't recognize Yahusha. The count to Shabuath, or Pentecost, is determined by getting this correct. This offering called Bikurim was fulfilled by Yahusha when he was resurrected. During the festival of Matzah, or unleavened bread, the high priest waved the first fruits of the barley harvest on the morrow after the weekly Sabbath. Yahushua became the wave sheaf offering because the resurrection was the object, and the wave sheaf was the shadowy outline predicting it. Now let's examine the monumentous events that surrounded Mashiach's death and how it would have played out on a timeline. Remember that a scriptural day begins and ends at sunset. It has nothing to do with sunrise to sunset or from midnight to midnight. Let's reason together for a moment and consider that Abib 13, which in the year that Yahushua died, would have landed on the fourth day of the week, or Wednesday. This being the day before Passover. It was on the fourth day of the week, or Wednesday, the 13th of Abib, that the disciples had prepared the meal known as the Last Supper. We find in the Mishnah a very important overlooked fact. The Galileans had adopted a tradition that in Hebrew is called Sada Masikik. This translates essentially to Last Supper. The Galileans established and celebrated an additional feast. They called it the Last Supper, which the Jews or the Yehudim living in or around Jerusalem did not observe. Only the northern tribe did. The Last Supper was a memorial event, remembering that it was not all the Hebrews who were in danger of death at Elohim's hand in Israel, I mean in Mitzrayim or Egypt, but only all the firstborn. This nighttime memorial meal was adopted whereby this meal would be eaten and then there would be a 24-hour fast that followed, thus labeling the name Last Supper. The next meal to be eaten was the Passover meal, after the Last Supper meal. What is important to remember here is Yahusha and his 12 emissaries were Galileans. The Talmud is the source from which the code of Jewish law is derived. It is made up of the Mishnah and the Gemara. The Mishnah is the original written version of the oral law, and the Gemara is the, re the record of the rabbis' discussions following this writing down of the oral law. What they were talking about is they were after they wrote it all down. So on Abib 13, the fourth day, Wednesday, the Last Supper was prepared. But it was not eating on Abib 13. Rather, it was after sundown, at the end of the day of Abib 13. 
that the meal was eaten. That is, it was eaten at the, as the first meal on the next day. The fifth day, which would be Thursday, or a bib 14th. The meal called the Last Supper was generally eating starting in the first hour of Passover. Yahusha commemorated this day by drinking wine that symbolizes his blood that establishes the renewed covenant, and by eating unleavened bread that symbolizes his body to which we became in union. For your information, this was not the traditional Passover cedar meal. That meal was yet to come because that meal is not eaten until the end of Passover day. And we're going to get into that. Therefore, at the start of the day of Abib 14, the fifth day or Thursday at nighttime, in the beginning of the Passover day, the people from Galilee ate a special meal commemorating the firstborn of all Israel that were saved from death in Egypt. And that meal was called the Last Supper. After eating the Last Supper, this is uh, where Yahushua proclaimed the words we traditionally call communion. They left and went to a garden on the Mount of Olives. So after they ate the Last Supper, they went to the Mount of Olives. The next event is that Yehuda or Judas, betrays Yahusha. And shortly after midnight, Yahusha is arrested. Yehuda or Judas betrayed our master Yahusha with a kiss. It is still the Passover day, though. In the early hours, a little before sunrise, he is wrongly judged with false witnesses and convict, convicted of blasphemy by the Sanhedrin. It is still Passover day. After the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, confirms his death sentence, Yahushua is scorched and then nailed to a Roman execution stake by the Roman soldiers. It is still Passover day, still the fifth day or Thursday of Bib 14. Around the same time that Yahushua expires or dies, around 3 p.m. in the afternoon is still Passover day. The slaughter of the Passover lambs begins in the temple grounds at that time. Approximately 250,000 sheep were killed and their blood collected between the hours of 3 p.m. and 6 p.m. on Passover day. The Lamb of Elohim is said to have died around the ninth hour, or around 3 p.m. He may have possibly been the first sacrificial lamb slaughtered that day considering he is the first of all things. Read 1 Corinthians 15. It is still Passover day because the sun has not yet set. Yahushua becomes our Passover lamb and his blood has been spilled on the altar of the earth or the arets for the remission of sins for many. Furthermore, Yahushua did not eat the Passover meal because he was the Passover lamb. While these events are occurring, a group of women are desperately begging the Roman soldiers to remove the Mashiach's corpse from the execution stake. This is because of the scriptural Sabbath requirement that they are in a frenzy to get the Messiah down and buried before evening comes. Now comes Joseph of Ramathium. He has been given permission by Pontius Pilate to claim the body of Yahushua for burial. So after they thrusted a spear into his side to ensure his death, the Roman soldiers took him down off of the stake and gave him to Joseph of Ramathium. The women are somewhat relieved at this point 
after the Roman soldiers relented and took the dead body down. Yehusaf and Nicodemus, or, uh, uh, Nicodemus bound the lifeless body in linen wrappings with spices. Then they placed him in a nearby fresh tomb in the garden. Yahusha is entombed before the sun sets on the Passover day. And it is still the Passover day. The sun has not gone down. Meanwhile, the butchered lambs are placed in the thousands of collective ovens located all around Jerusalem, or Jerusalem both inside and outside the city walls, so that the hundreds of thousands of visiting pilgrims can cook their Passover lambs. And it is still Passover day. Shortly after the sun sinks over the horizon, three medium-sized stars become visible, thus ending Passover day. It is now nighttime. Passover day has ended and the first day of unleavened bread or matzah begins. It is now a bib 15, the sixth day or Friday. One may ask, where did the Passover meal go? Aren't they supposed to eat the Passover meal on Passover day? On the contrary, Passo the Passover meal is to be eaten after dark at the end of the day of Abib 14. This means the day has changed from the fifth day, or Thursday, to the sixth day, or Friday, the 15th. It is also the first day of the Festival of Unleavened Bread. That is correct. The Passover meal, technically, is not eaten on Passover day. It is the first meal of the new day on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or Matzah. Why? Because that is exactly how it happened in Egypt. They began eating the Passover meal at sunset, and some continued to eat right up to around midnight on the bib 15th. This is the same night that Yahuwah killed all the unprotected firstborns throughout the Mitzrayim, or Egypt. The firstborn Hebrew was protected by the blood of the lambs that was applied to the doorposts and lentils of their dwelling places. We learned earlier what is special and different about the first day of matzah. It is a festival Shabbat day, not the weekly seventh Shabbat, but a festival high Shabbat. The sixth day which was Friday of Bib 15th, being a festival or a high Shabbat, had the same requirement as the normal weekly Sabbath had. That is, the handling of a human corpse was highly prohibited. This is why we read in the scriptures that there was a frenzy of sorts to get Yahusha buried before dark. When the day would change from the festival of Passover, which was not a high Sabbath, to the first day of unleavened bread, which was a high Sabbath. Henceforth, initiating the Torah instructions applying to a festival high Sabbath. And obey the command not to mess with the deceased body. Being the day of rest, a bit 15th was a fairly uneventful day. It was the sixth day. Friday, the festival high Sabbath that began the week-long festival of unleavened bread. The 15th day of Abib ended at sundown, and now it is the seventh day, or Saturday, Abib 16th. This is, of course, the regular Hebrew weekly seventh day Sabbath. Abib 16th was the second consecutive rest day in a row back-to-back -back Sabbaths, if you will. So this would have been another uneventful day, as most were resting in their dwelling places. Now, at sundown on Abib 16th, the weekly Shabbat ends, and the first day of the week began, 
It is now the first day, or the sun's day, Abib 17th, which begins Bikurim, or first fruits. It is also the third day of Matzah. This is the day Yahushua HaMashiach's resurrected body walked out of the tomb alive, assumingly within the first hour, or at least sometime before midnight, but definitely before daybreak. For many years now, past festivals of first fruits have been celebrated on the Bib 16th as a fixed tradition of the Yehudim. In fact, it was the Pharisees who long ago ordered it done this way, as opposed to the way it was observed in Yahusha's day. Definitely, this change in observance would have occurred after the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, or CE. This being the war that destroyed the second temple on the Temple Mount and the majority of Jerusalem itself, along with it. This huge architectural loss is how and why the earthly priesthood became non-operational and why the Sanhedrin lost control. Furthermore, the Sadducees were the high priests at this time, and so with the loss of the temple, their earthly priesthood also ended, and they lost their control over the matter of blood sacrifices, rituals, and traditions. After the destruction of the temple, the Pharisees gained power and control, and they decided that rather than first fruits moving around on the calendar, it would always be a bib 16th that first fruits would be celebrated on. Don't forget the Pharisees uh, were the arch enemies of the Messiah. So they didn't recognize his atonement sacrifice, blood sacrifice that, that ended all sacrifices. Many still hold to this fixed traditional date even today. Although traditions insist that first fruits always be on Abib 16th, this is not always the case. Sometimes it is, though. So in conclusion, notice that by the timeline that we discussed above, Yahushua has been in the tomb for three days and three nights, just as the sign of the prophet Jonah in the stomach of the great fish shadowed. Yahushua himself prophesied he would be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Read Matthew 12, 38, 40. So this uh, explanation uh, of the error on the timeline of Yahushua's uh, death, burial, and resurrection, I believe, solves the issue because he obviously couldn't have been uh, that he uh, died and was buried on, on uh, Friday and, and rose on Sunday morning, like the Christians say, because that's only two. Scripture says three. So I hope this helps, and uh, stay in love with your lamb, Master Yahusha HaMashiach. Thank you for watching. Bonus feature two time. The first day of Sukkot or tents or booths is also considered the carnal birthday of Yahusha. Many Nazarene elders and Hebrew scholars believe Yahusha was born on the first day of Sukkot or tents in a booth or a temporary animal shelter in the seventh month of the year. These temporary animal booths were commonly used by shepherds to shelter their livestock around the hilly countryside surrounding Jerusalem. 
obviously being animal shelters, they would have had some type of bedding uh, of hay or some sort, feeding troughs and buckets of water in them for the animals. These animal shelters are described in Genesis 33, 17, and Jacob was probably the first one mentioned, or first mentioned Hebrew, to have erected a booth for his livestock. A group of shepherds watching over their flocks by night were visited by messengers or angels who brought them the good tidings or the besorah or the good news that a sovereign child who was the Mashiach or Messiah was born this night in a booth near a small town called Bethlehem. After hearing the breaking news, the shepherds set out to seek this newborn king of Israel, a deliverer, a promised deliverer, who is the Mashiach and the master. The shepherds found the sovereign baby wrapped up in blankets and lying in a food trough inside a temporary structure made for livestock. Apparently somewhere outside the walls of this tiny village or town called Bethlehem. Another bit of evidence that Yahushua was born in the fall season and not the winter is that the shepherds were still living in the fields with their livestock. Obviously, they would not have been living in the fields in the middle of winter because it would have been too cold in the highest elevation surrounding Jerusalem. And besides, during the winter months in those mountainous ranges or regions, there is not enough grass or fresh water to sustain huge flocks of animals. The Magi, who were magicians or sorcerers from Babylon, they were not wise men, ardently studied the prophecies of Daniel holding him in high esteem because he saved the lives of their ancestors. Could not have been present at the time of Yahushua's birth. This would have been like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Joseph and Mary were in the Jerusalem area for the whole week of Sukkoth, or Tabernacles. They were entangled among throngs and throngs of people. This was a pilgrimage festival. All males, adult males, are commanded to go there. So there would have been throngs of people. The Messiah was born on the first day of booths or sukkah or tabernacles meaning that on top of everything else that was going on, Mary was under a strict Torah cleansing command. She was unclean and could not go to the sanctuary for seven days after the birth of a male. On the eighth day, the male child was required to be circumcised. After the ceremonial circumcision, Mary remained unclean for another 33 days. Scripture says, And when the days of her cleansing, according to the Torah of Moses, were completed, they brought him to the sanctuary in Jerusalem to present him to Yahuwah, as it has been written in the Torah of Yahuwah. Every male who opens the womb shall be called set apart to Yahuwah, and to give an offering according to what is said to the Torah of Yahuwah. So let's read Leviticus 12. Applying some basic math, the child is already 40 days old and growing at this point. So when the Magi, or the magicians, finally found the sovereign child, he was between two months old and two years old and was living in a house in Bethlehem. 
and upon entering the house, they bowed down at his feet and worshipped him. The magicians are only mentioned in the memoirs of Matthew. You find it in Matthew 2. Although Luke does give a detailed description about the birth of our Messiah and the ceremonial customs that followed, he never mentions Herod the Great or the Magi, probably because it was irrelevant. You can read about it in Luke 2. Essentially, the reason there was no room at the lodging place for Joseph and Mary was because the town was packed, jam-packed with pilgrims. Bethlehem was only 5.5 miles south of Jerusalem, making it a favorite pit stop to eat and rest for the night. While Joseph and Mary were held up somewhere near the small town of Bethlehem by these huge throngs of people, Mary went into labor. Can you imagine that? The overcrowding would have been bad enough for a pregnant woman, but the throngs made it overwhelmingly uncontrollable and uncomfortable and brutally embarrassing when she began wailing with labor pains. Imagine that, screaming and hollering for labor pains, all these people all around you looking at you. This estimated population of Bethlehem at that particular time was roughly 1,435 people. But during the Festival of Tabernacles, the influx of people swelled the numbers to over 4,000 in that little town. Try to imagine the scenario if you can. Tabernacles being one of the three pilgrimage festivals required that all males from 20 years old and up had to observe Sukkoth in Jerusalem. Surely then, the reason why Joseph from Nazareth was heading to Jerusalem was to obey the Torah pilgrimage command. In fact, all the men of Israel were descending upon Jerusalem. Most of these men had their families in tow, causing even more congestion. The throngs were massive. The pressure to move out of the crowded towns and to the outskirts was overbearing, and tents were popping up everywhere, as far as the eye could see. Caravans of people were merging into the walled cities from all different directions. They were coming from the north, the south, east, and west. Based on a recorded census taken by the Romans, it was estimated that the population of Jerusalem was near 40,000, but during the festival of Sukkoth, it is believed that the crowd size may have swelled to over 600,000 people. The entire population of Israel was estimated to be around 1.1 million at that time. It would have been extremely difficult just to get from one town to another. All roads, trails, and paths and fields were jam-packed with humans, camels, horses, oxes, cattle, sheep, dogs, carts, wagons, and more. And the day prior to the first day of tabernacles, the day she began her labor, would have been the worst congested day of all, because everybody was rushing in there to get the best spot. After using our imagination just a little bit, we can plainly see that this situation created a really big problem for the young mother about to give birth to the Messiah. And an animal shelter would have been looking pretty good at this point. And she was definitely better uh, giving birth. It was better for her to give birth in the animal shelter than give birth in the middle of some field or in an alleyway or upon a rock of some sort. Following their birth, all males were required to be circumcised on the eighth day, immediately following their birth. 
according to the Torah. Since the sovereign Yahushua was born on the first day of tabernacles, then he was circumcised on the closing day of the festival, also known as the great last great day. Thank you for watching, folks. And remember to stay in love with Yahushua. Bonus feature time number three. Today's your lucky day. Told you this was going to be a long one. Um, let's take a look at some additional scripture or information that is worth mentioning and some information that is worth repeating, perhaps. Uh, number one... Scripture says, And now, if you dil diligently obey my voice and shall guard my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession above all peoples, for all the earth is mine. That's Exodus 19, 5. There are three festivals and that are considered or labeled pilgrimage festivals referring to the three commanded festivals in which all males 20 years of age and up are to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem or Jerusalem to give reference to Yahuwah. These three commanded pilgrimages are Passover, Shabbat, and Tabernacles. On six of the seven appointed times, we are to eat a feast to Yahuwah. The exception is Yom Kippur, or Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement. This day is the fast to Yahuwah. We are not to eat or drink, even if it falls on the weekly Sabbath. We are commanded to afflict your being. The appointed times are also rest days in our festival high Sabbaths. They are similar but subtly different from the weekly Sabbaths. If a high Sabbath falls on the weekly Sabbath, the high Sabbath rules supreme over the weekly Sabbath. Matzah, or the seven days of unleavened bread, and Sukkot or tabernacles are week-long festivals each having two rest days the first day and the last day for matzah and the first day and the eighth day for tabernacles respectively Yahuwah's appointed times are shadows of things to come for the body of Mashiach they are the outline his of his redemption plan. Read Matthew 22. In other words, these are prophesied events that are sure to happen. The seven appointed times are one indivisible plan for all people. There's only one husband or head and only one bride or body of Mashiach. After all, has been put under Yahusha's feet, the head and the body will be made subject to Yahuwah in order that Yahuwah be all in all. Read 1 Corinthians 20 through 28. Yom Teruah, or trumpets, is the only feast that occurs during or around the day of the new moon. The new moon is when the moon doesn't shine at all. It is when the moon is just a dark black disk hanging in the sky. It is the darkest night of the month. Although the word trumpets is implied to this name, we do not blow a trumpet. We blow a shofar made of ram's horn. 
scripture says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a festival or of the new moon or of the Shabbat days, which are a shadow of things to come for the body of Mashiach. Uh, compare Colossians 2, 16 through 17 to Isaiah 8, 20. Yahuwah is love, and love is the purpose of life. And scripture says, and this is love, that we walk according to his commands. Find that in 1 John 1. In 1 John 2, we read, The one who says, I know him, and does not guard his commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Since Yahushua HaMashiach said he is the truth, then this must be speaking of the indwelling spirit of Yahushua, not being in them. They do not obey their, his commands. If he's indwelling you, you are willing and able to obey his commands. Obeying his commands have become your joy. If he indeed indwells you, if you are his. The seven appointed times, or the modem, are found in Leviticus 23 and Numbers 28 and 29. We are commanded to proclaim them at their appointed times as Kodesh Mikra, meaning set apart proclamations or called out rehearsals. Yahushua was cut off from the living, fulfilling Passover. The three days and three nights he was in the tomb validated his teaching authority, which he gave us as the sign of Jonah. On the first day of the next week during the seven-day period of matzah, his body became the real wave sheaf offering, the Bikurim, the firstborn from the dead. His resurrection was the reality, and the wave sheaf, uh, or the Bikurim, was the shadow of things to come. Bikurim is the Hebrew word for first fruits, and the same word for firstborn. A child is metaphorically fruit. Your firstborn child is metaphorically your first fruit. The Shabbat, or Pentecost in Greek, meaning count 50, is commemorating the giving of Torah at Sinai. The ten words are a marriage covenant, a blood covenant of love. We are to obey our husband. Yahusha, and stay faithful and true to him. Being cleansed by his precious blood and water, we have now became his wise virgin brides, having fulfilled our lamps with the proper oil, meaning we have the Ruach HaKadosh in us, and Yahusha has filled our hearts with his Torah, or has inscribed his Ten Commandments on our hearts and mind, on our inward parts. Yahushua said, He is the way, the truth, and the life. He fills us with the manna from heaven, or bread of life, and living waters, which both refer to the Torah. On Shabbat, his life joined to the minds of his followers in such a way that they received the power to guard and teach his Torah. He writes a love for Torah on the hearts of those who receive him. We are his witnesses that he is Elohim. Read Isaiah 43:12. Basak is often used as a general term for Passover, but actually Basak engulfs the first three festivals. These three are Passover, seven days of unleavened bread, and first fruits. Some include Shabbat within the Pesach general term. Most do not. Yahusha is our Passover, one offering for all, 
our lamb was slain on the 14th day of the first month, a bib, about the ninth hour or three o'clock p.m. on an executioner's stake or a wooden beam, a pole, a timber, and Peter calls it a tree in 1 Peter 2.24. Noteworthy, the crux or cross is a pagan symbol of sun worship. The Greeks associate the crux or cross with Jesus, or by hailing Zeus, they hold up his image of the sun, which is the cross. Passover is not a high Sabbath day. The high Sabbath days are the first day of matzah, or unleavened bread, and the last day of matzah, or unleavened bread. Shabuoth, Yom Teruah, or day of trumpets, Yom Kippur, or Yom Kafar, or the day of atonement, or the fast. The first day of Sukkot, or tents, or booths, or tabernacles. The morrow after the last day of Sukkot or Tabernacles, which is the eighth day, also known as the last great day. Passover is known as Pesach in general, engulfs them all, all the uh, summer f uh, festivals. Um, Shabuoth, the giving of the Torah at Sinai, relates in comparison to Acts 2. Yahuwah's presence came upon the mountain in fire, and Yahushua's spirit came into the Nazarene, sealing them with his name, and immersing them as with fire. Sinai was, was his dwelling place, and we became his dwelling place as he promised. The first covenant was inscribed in stone by the finger of Yahuwah as the everlasting covenant, placed inside the ark in the inner chamber of his temple, and 120 followers in the upper chamber received the power of Yahushua's spirit. He inscribed his Torah in their hearts and minds as the renewed covenant. He placed them inside the ark, which is our being, in the inner chamber, which is our heart and mind, of his temple, which is our body. Read Jeremiah 31. Stay humble and walk with humility, for our Elohim is a consuming fire. Read Hebrews 12, 29. The Passover meal consists of lamb, matzah, and bitter herbs. It should be eaten in haste, with shoes on and fully dressed, with your walking sticks present. The Hebrew children was on high alert and ready to march out of bondage at a moment's notice. For your information, if, not, if you are not in Jerusalem during Passover, only the shank of a lamb should be eaten. Yahuwah has set his word and his name above all, Psalms 138.2. And his word of truth, or the Torah, his word of truth, or the Torah, and his name, Yahuwah, is placed above all. So in this light, how can it be that his name, or his Torah, or Old Testament, has been abolished or re irrelevant if he placed them above all how can man place them below anything else ridiculous the elect are those guarding the commands of Yahuwah and possessing the witness of Yahushua Mashiach you can read about that in Revelations 12 and Revelations 14 they are called the Nazarene meaning branches or watchmen Depends on the context you're using the word in, Nazarene. The assembly of the Nazarene is plainly defined in Revelations 3, verses 7 through 13. And Paul 
was accused as being the ringleader of the Nazarene during his time. You can read about that in Acts. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The seven festivals are for all believers, not just for the Jews. There is only one Yahuwah. Yahuwah is one. One Torah, one Messiah, one body, one bride, one covenant, one renewed covenant, one commission, one Israel, one kingdom. Yahuwah does not lie or change. His words stand forever. They are eternal and living. Yahusha is Yahuwah manifested. He is the Alif and the Tall. And he is from everlasting to everlasting. Read Revelations 1 in context. There is a higher calling. The called out ones will be in the first resurrection and rule with Yahuwah forever. They are his bride in or Asha. They will be redeemed on or about Yom Kippur sometime in the near future. Read Philippians 3 verses 13 and 14. These mentioned seven festivals or appointed times are not the total of all Yahuwah's appointed times, but are the ones outlining, outlining his redemption plan. For example, the weekly Sabbath is also an ordained appointed time. It was first commanded at creation and was ordained as the sign of the everlasting covenant forever. The word Sabbath appears nine times, and the disciples were recorded as keeping the Sabbath day over 80 times in the book of Acts alone. So there remains a Sabbath keeping for the people of Yahuwah. Read Hebrews 4, verse 9. The weekly Sabbath is a sign that we are his people and that we belong to him, and that he, we are his servants. Keeping it is evidence of whom we serve. We are to feast and be joyful while entering his rest. The weekly Sabbath will keep will be kept in the future during his eternal kingdom. The weekly Sabbath is forever. Read Exodus 31, 13 through 17, Isaiah 56, 3, Isaiah 66, 22 in Ezekiel 20, 12. It is possible and may be that after the old earth and heaven pass away by fire, that Yahuwah will recreate the new earth and new heaven in a seven-day pattern again, and we will be resting on the last day again, which may be why the Sabbath will last forever. Always go back and read all extracted or cherry-picked verses in their respective chapters in context. This is how we find truth. This is the only way to debunk falsehood and false doctrines. By reading in context, stop cherry-picking verses. Stay in belief. Keep the expectation. Love one another. The greatest of these is love. Yahushua said we would not see him again until we say, Blessed is he who is coming in the name of Yahuwah. Or Barak Habab Bashem Yahuwah. Compare John 12, 13 to Psalms 118, 26. Scripture says, come out of her, my people. By paraphrasing this meaning into modern English, it may say, hello, wake up now and part ways with the walking dead and the idol and idolaters. It's about to get very serious, folks. Wake up. Read about Read Isaiah 29, 13 through 14, compare it to Matthew 15, 8. 
Repentance is a change of mind and heart. This change of mind allows us to fall in love with the Torah and promise to obey Yahusha as would a bride her husband. We accept his love and give him our love back. Love is all that we will remain, and love is all there is and ever will be. The moon phases are a concept that mostly refers to the temporal period it takes the moon to renew. Starting with the new moon, this being the first day of the moon phase, it appears hanging in the sky as a dark disk with zero light building on it, and it is at its darkest. Day by day, light subtly builds upon the face of the moon until 15 days later, when the light completely fills the disk. It is now fully illuminated and at its brightest. This is called the full moon. Then the cycle reverses until the moon renews. Traditionally, the moon cycle identifies with our spiritual life suggesting our struggle with the flesh is a constant cycle, a constant struggle. But even though we continually fall away from the light, even to the point of complete darkness, Yahuwah never leaves us. He only builds us back up. He subtly brings us back out of that complete darkness and back into his marvelous light. Synonymously, the new moon represents our darkest, most disobedient time when we're farthest away from Yahuwah. And the full moon represents our illuminated, most obedient time when we are the closest to Yahuwah. Waxing suggests that we are advancing toward the light and waning suggests we are falling away into darkness. So it is said in Jewish traditions that the human life cycle mimics the moon cycling. Our liberty is from sin and death, not the law or the commandments. By the unmerited kindness of Yahuwah, we are being saved or delivered through his gift of belief. By receiving his gift of belief, we are compelled to obey him out of fear or love. Make no mistake, it is not our obedience that saves us, but it is evidence of our belief and evidence that we are being saved or delivered. It is impossible to repent while staying lawless. Start obeying the commandments. They're easy. Torah is the Hebrew word which specifically refers to the covenant also known as the Ten Words or Ten Commandments. Torah is also used to generally refer to the five books or scrolls of Moshe or Moses. The Torah's effect on the world is exhibiting a love for Yahuwah and others. Rejecting the Torah or abolishing the Torah results in hate, fear, ruin, violence, and leads to death the second death. If we refuse to receive a love for the truth or the Torah, then he sends us a strong delusion to believe the lie or the imposter. That lie is that obedience is unnecessary to please Yahuwah. This is the secret of lawlessness, also known or called the mystery of iniquity. Read 2 Theologians chapter 2 in context, over and over and over. If we simply believe that Yahushua died for our sins so that we can continue to disobey and be lawless and keep on sinning willfully, we are in error, major error. Because this teaching is the, fair, the very thing or reason that the author of Hebrews directly refutes in Hebrews 10, verses 16 through 28. It is not too hard or impossible to obey Torah. We are empowered to obey the covenant by the supernatural power of Yahushua's indwelling spirit. 
Look, Yahusha said, my yoke is light and the burden is easy. But he does warn that it comes with a worldly cost attached to it. Persecution for righteousness sake. The message of the kingdom is repent for the reign of Yahuwah draws near. Although this message was repeated over and over and over by Yahusha, it still remains a mystery of sort and veiled to those Yahuwah does not call. Yahusha did not come to destroy the Torah or his commandments. He came to destroy the works or the activities of the devil. Salah. Peace and love to everyone. And I hope this lesson helps you obey and understand the seven festivals or seven appointed times of Yahuwah. And also to keep the weekly Sabbath. Remember folks to love Yahuwah with all your mind, heart, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Shalom, everyone. Amen. And amen. Bonus feature four time. Finally, let's take a look at the spiritual meaning attached to the seven appointed times of Yahuwah. Since the seven appointed times represent the shadow of his redemption plan for the body of believers, then common sense says that the spiritual meaning hidden in the seven appointed times will contain the same type messages. In other words, the spiritual meaning will also reveal his salvation and redemption plans to us. Although the Last Supper is not an ordained festival found in the Torah, it was commanded to be observed nevertheless as a remembrance or a memorial of Yahusha's death by Yahusha himself. So with that in mind, the Last Supper is eaten with matzah and wine. The matzah on this day spiritually represents Yahusha's flesh or the manna from heaven. When we eat of his flesh, we will never hunger or die. This spiritually represents the Torah, or the living words, or the word of truth. Also, spiritually, when we drink the wine, it is symbolic of his blood that he shed to protect us from the spirit of death, just like the blood of lambs protected the firstborn in Egypt. When the blood of lambs was spread on their, on the doorposts and lentils of their dwelling places. Our sacrificial lamb protects us from death since the elect are the first fruits of sorts of the kingdom reign of Yahuwah. The observers who always observe the last supper each year do so because it was commanded of us to do it as a memorial. It is usually observed along with the washing of other believers' feet. This was in fact given to us to do by Yahushua himself in Matthew 26, when he said, 
this is my body and this is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Some observers like to spread wine or ketchup on their doorposts and lentil as a reenactment of sorts in order to teach their children the importance of the Last Supper. So spiritually then, this serves as a reminder to remind us that the living words or Yahusha's blood protects us from sin and death. The Passover spiritually represents the renewed covenant and the remission of our sins and our deliverance by the blighting out of the crimes or sins which was against us with the precious blood of the Lamb or of Yahusha. Spiritually, we are cleansed or cleaned up by the blood and our sins have been forgotten by Yahuwah. This blood atonement sacrifice is applied to our lives after our repentance, but usually while we are still partly in the world or partly in the mind of the flesh. The matzah, or matzah, spiritually represents us putting out the sin and pride of a rebellious heart and the teaching of men, such as traditions, idolatry, falsehoods, witchcraft, astrology, and the like. This spiritually represents us partaking of the manna from heaven, not the puffed up teachings of men. First fruits spiritually represents our water immersion, being born again of the Spirit, a chosen people to Yahuwah. Spiritually speaking, when a firstborn child comes from the womb, he is leaving the water and breathes in the spiritual breath of Yahuwah. This spiritually means we have left the watery grave or tomb and have entered the world as a new creature, walking in spirit and truth. The spiritual realm of reality is where truth and love resides. We are now a new spiritual creature in Messiah. Shabuot or Pentecost, which is understood to be the marriage of Yahuwah and the children of Israel at Sinai, this spiritually represents the indwelling spirit of Yahusha, taking up residence in his cleaned up temple, which has been thoroughly cleaned by the water and the blood. He has now inscribed the renewed marriage vows on our inward parts. He sits on the mercy seat, which is our inner being, our most inner chamber, that was made in the image or essence of Yahuwah and speaks to us from there on a daily basis. Now, Teruah spiritually represents the first resurrection of the dead in Mashiach, just days prior to his second coming back to earth. It announces the soon return of the king. Yom Kippur spiritually represents the last day that mankind or the lost sheep living among the Gentiles can be delivered. This is when the fullness of the Gentiles will have come in. This is spiritually the day the living in Mashiach that remain alive will be changed in the wink of an eye into immortality. At the closing of this day, the reapers will remove the tars or weeds by fire. I believe that the first resurrection group will have been given their immortal bodies and will have been walking on the earth for the ten days of all. Then on the tenth day of the days of all, the ones who remain will get their immortal bodies so that the burning of the earth and the melting of the elements will not affect them. Sukuf or Bus, spiritually, is a magnificent event. 
this spiritually represents the consummation of the wedding feast and the return of the king, Yahusha, on the day of Yahuwah. This, of course, follows the great tribulation years and the judgment of the unrighteous. Spiritually, this indicates that Yahusha will return to earth the same day that he came to earth the first time as a babe, on the first day of tabernacles. The closing day of Sukkoth, or Booth, or the eighth day, or the last great day, spiritually represents the renewed or new creation. In other words, we will no longer be dwelling in our temporary dwelling places, but we'll be dwelling in our permanent booths or tents made of immortality, on a new earth and under a new heaven and in a new city called Yahuwah Shammah, which means city of his people. This is where he will dwell with us forever and ever, and his righteousness will dwell there also forever. All who have made it into eternal life will have their hearts circumcised with the love for Yahuwah, his word, his name, and all the brethren or other body members. Spirit, uh, scripture says, Therefore, whatever you wish men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the Torah and the prophets. Enter in through the narrow gate, because the gate is narrow and the way hard pressed, which leads to life. And there are few who find it. But beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are savage wolves. So there you have it, folks. I hope this video leads you to finding the straight path that will lead you through the narrow gate. I am the leaf in the tall the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those doing his commands, so that the authority shall be theirs to the tree of life, and to enter through the gates into the city. But outside are the dogs, and those who enchant with drugs, and those who whore, and the murderers, and the idolaters, and all who love and do falsehood. I, Yahushua, have sent my messenger to witness to you these in the assemblies. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And he who hears, let him say, Come. And he who thirsts, come. And he who desires it, take the water of life without pain. Peace and love to all the Nazarim who are the beloved of Yahuwah. Barak Habab Bashim Yahuwah. Maranatha. Amen and amen. Shalom.
Yeah. 